I want to show you, uh, before we get into today's message, I want to show you a prophetic word that was given to us in the 9 o'clock service, similar word in the 11 o'clock on the weekend of our power conference as our ushers are passing out notes. And I want to preach uh, the text that she prophesies over us. I'm going to give some detail and some framework to it in a message I've called Step Beyond the Threshold. And um, receive this prophetic word as they play it on the screen now. Go ahead. Now, in this being the year of the door, I really felt like the Lord wanted to decree this over Kings, Alaska. Because in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus himself is speaking about being the door. And it says this, it says, and to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, or let's just say the angel to the church at Kings in Wasilla, write these things. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Listen to what the Lord is saying to this house. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. I want you to lift your hands up all over this place. For Go the ahead. Lord says to Kings Alaska that I have set an open door before you yes. that no man can shut. It is a door to this state and it is a door to the nation and it is a door of favor even to other nations. The Spirit of the Lord says your labor has not been in vain. That there is a season of heavenly partnership that I am bringing to you as the heavens are open the earth is also opening even over this region says God and the Lord says that I am even causing the hovering host of heaven the angelic army to come down and to begin to break the way open for you says the Spirit of God the Lord says that it is not just a matter of doing the things that are set before you, but this is a season of heavenly partnership. This is a season where I'm sending angel armies down to assist you in your families, in your workplace, yes. in the harvest, says the Lord. For I'm sending harvest angels down to King's Chapel here. I'm sending harvest angels down to bring you into that place of breakthrough. For the Lord says that I put a mandate on this house and you can't back down I put a mandate on this house says the Lord and the only way is the way forward you're like the children of Israel at the Red Sea and sometimes you feel like the enemy is pursuing you and you don't see any way forward but the Spirit of the Lord says just as I came down in that day and I made a way where it didn't seem to be a way the Lord says that I'm gonna open doors supernaturally for you and what looks like the brink of disaster is instead gonna turn into the brink of the supernatural and I'm going to open things up to you, says the Lord, that you have not even entered your imagination. And the Lord says that the spirit of breakthrough that has been forged in the furnace of affliction, where the enemy has pursued you on every hand, but it, what it has served to do instead is to gain you credibility with principalities and powers. It has served, says the Lord, that your breakthroughs become the breakthrough for the state against the spirit of religion, against the forces of witchcraft, against the humanistic spirit that has tried to take control of this state. The spirit of the Lord says, against the dragon spirit, against the spirit of Leviathan, the Lord says your breakthrough, it becomes the breakthrough for the state. Eight. and I'm loosing a governmental anointing on kings a governmental anointing as the ecclesia to rule and reign but the Lord says also many many people will run for public office that are coming out of kings that have been influenced by kings and the spirit of the Lord says get ready because I'm bringing you into those days of acceleration I'm bringing you into those times says the Lord of increased influence not just on your pastors not just on your leaders but for this house and the Lord says each and every one of you are being asked to step up and step in to a new place of authority step up and step in to a new place of governmental anointing I'll bless you on your jobs I'll bless you in your cities I'll 
God bless you even in the state, says the Lord. And I'm getting ready to blow on Anchorage, says the Lord. Hey. And the Lord says, uh, I don't know if you guys have, a, have a, an extension there, but the Lord says, I'm revisiting the vision for Anchorage for kings. And the Lord says, I'm going to breathe on that, which the enemy tried to shut down years ago. I'm going to breathe on that, and I'm going to cause an explosion of revival to take place Hallelujah. in Anchorage, says the Lord, the yes. key city of this state. And the Lord says, you're going to see wave after wave after wave of glory come upon this state because of the prayers that you prayed, because of the breakthroughs that you've made. And the Spirit of the Lord says, rise up and enter in to a new season and new doors of authority, says your Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand? Would you go ahead that? and clap and shout to God? Now, in See, we, we really highly esteem the prophetic word. And of course, it's to be judged and it's to be weighed in many different ways, primarily by God's word. If you were in the inner circles of some of the meetings that I've had uh, in recent weeks, and then to hear that prophetic word over us, it was astounding. We already have people that are in public office. We have people that are running for public office. We have strategy and planning for Anchorage, which we are going to do uh, with great diligence as God leads us. There's so much in that prophetic word that's taking place that she knew nothing about. We don't get in the back with our guest speakers and people with prophetic voices and tell them everything that's happening. We just trust that they're gonna hear from God and share that. That word was powerful and I wanted to play it again. And I wanted to preach a message uh, using that as a basis, especially Revelation chapter three, seven through 13 going to teach and preach to you a message from those verses of scripture. Uh, let's get right into the notes. I'm not going to read the text because she read most of it, but I will look at and preach to you. Revelation 3, 7 to 13, we'll look at those verses as we apply this to our lives at this special message uh, today. And then we're going to move into a new series called Defeating Death. This is a series as we'll move us all the way to Easter, and we'll let you know more about that. That'll start next next week by the grace of God. There is a dark spiritual world that attempts to shut us down. We are highly aware of that, acutely aware of that. It comes from that text of scripture in Ephesians chapter six and verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is an attempt on behalf of darkness to stop you. Now that might be new for you, but I would say that most of you are aware of that. There really is a devil, there really is hell, there really are demons, there really are powers of darkness that attempt to stop the church and attempt to stop you from fulfilling what God called you to do. And they do everything they can and they've been defeated by the blood of the lamb. Can I get an amen? And God is inviting us through this prophetic word and uh, through others as well to, to go through the door. I've, I've entitled it beyond, moving beyond the threshold. Stepping beyond the threshold. Step beyond the door. There's doors that are open for us, but you have to move through them. In the building of this building, we had people laugh at us. We had all kinds of challenges financially. We had bankers say it's impossible, but we knew that God had given us a door and he told us to move through. Well, how do you move through when you can't? Well, that, that's where God shows up. So God is inviting us to move through a door that might seem like it's locked right now. And that could be circumstantially in your life. It could be in your own mind. You could have set ways of thinking that holds you back, limiting thoughts. You could have your emotions that come against you. You could have patterns in your life, destructive patterns of captivity that go over and over and over. They're going to be dismantled this year. Can you say amen? amen. If you do your part, God will do his. He won't do your part. He won't do my part. We have to do our part to move through the door of opportunity, to move through the door to see these plans of God come about. And there's all kinds of challenges. There's time barriers. I mean, I, I can tell you stories the rest of the morning about how God brought us through impossible scenarios over all the years that we've been serving him, as well as in ministry. Never mind the past seven years of building this building. 
So there's breakthrough, as she prophesied, as God's word declares to us. Let's look at the text, verse 7. The angel of the church of Philadelphia and, and uh, Jane Hammond took liberty to say to the angel of the church in Wasilla, write these things. Says he who is holy and he who is true, who has the key of David, fantastic scripture. He who opens it, no one can shut and shut what no one can open. That is a reference that is a reference to the Old Testament passage found in Isaiah chapter 22. And the prophet is declaring that there is this key of David given to Elikim, who was a type of Christ. And so while in the, in the book of Revelation, John the Revelator, by the Spirit of God, is referencing Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22, it implies that that David's servant had a key to open the gates and no one can come in unless that David's servant opens the gates. And it implies basically that Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophetic type and shadow in Revelation, uh, in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. Jesus is the fulfillment of that and it declares it in the text to be read. And he is the one that opens in fact, without him, there is no way, there is no truth, there is no life. With him, we can have our sins forgiven. He opens a door to forgiveness. He opens a door to revelation. He opens a door to heaven, truly. Jesus holds the key of David. Can you say Jesus holds the keys? And that theme you'll find in Scripture, not only in the text that we just read, but in Revelation chapter 1 and 17 through 18, don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I am the living one, I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. I hold the keys. Come on, somebody say he holds the keys. I hold the keys of death and Hades. And I can't read that and not be reminded of a, a passage of scripture that's a, a set passage, a life message from our senior global pastor, Dr. Morocco in Matthew 16, 19. I give you keys. Come on, somebody said, God gives me keys. See, God wants to partner with us. So there's an open door, but you have to do your part to go through. I've set before you an open door. There's an open door out front. Some, some of you, well, I think all of you came through the doors to come into the building. I'm pretty sure of that. Some people didn't go through the open doors. They're not here. You understand? So Matthew 16, 19, I give you keys of the kingdom of heaven whatsoever you Bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever be loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus not only has keys, he gives them to us. He partners with us. Now that is amazing. I remember so many years ago when I was a, a newbie at church and uh, thank God for being new. I didn't understand that Jesus wasn't going to do everything. Everything that I couldn't do, he did. Then he requires me to do my part. I have to pray the prayer. I have to repent. I have to agree. You have a free will. He's not just going to come and just do it for you. No, we, we partner with it. Jesus has opened a door that no one can shut. A door to heaven. Wow. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. I'll read it to you. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, verse 26 of Hebrews 9. Then he would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I want you to say that. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Think about that. Just think about that. If once you receive Jesus, your sin is gone. Doesn't mean you can't keep doing it. You can. But as it's recorded in heaven, your sin is forgiven when you've received Jesus, when you repent. Verse 27, as he appointed men to die once, but after that, the judgment. So Christ offered once to bear the sins of many. Going down to verse 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, 
by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart of full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Go to Revelation chapter four. So he opened a door through his death and through his resurrection for you. Come on, somebody say there's an open door for me. You might have think that you've gone beyond what could be forgivable, but you're absolutely wrong. It doesn't matter what you've done. I mean, it matters and you'll have consequences for that, but before heaven, you can be forgiven of every sin, every single sin. There's not one thing that you have done that can keep you from entering into the, into the very throne room, being forgiven, being washed, being cleansed. It says in Romans that we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He takes away your sin. He throws it as far as the east is from the west. He washes you. He redeems you. He makes you a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Come on, that's a door, a door to heaven heaven for you. Some of you don't understand that, so you don't come with full assurance of faith. You come groveling. You come, you come begging. You don't have to beg. Jesus made a way for you. Can I preach in here? Jesus made a way for you. You don't have to beg. My son led worship. What a wonderful job. Wonderful. My son does not ask me to go into the fridge. He doesn't ask to come into my house. He, know, he has a key. And he knows where the hide key is. So even if he has misplaced his key, he knows where there's another key. And he, believe me, he comes in at 21 and that boy can eat. He's like, oh, mom, can I have a glass of milk? I just, you know my heart. And if I could just have a small glass of milk, some of you treat God like that. I'm preaching better than your amen in here. Revelation chapter 4. The door to the throne room. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet which, with me saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes and front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature like a face, like a man, the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they did not rest day or night saying, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. There is an open door. I, I, I took, there's some interesting things with AI, a little creepy. But I, I went ahead and um, took this text of scripture and plugged it in an image creator. This is it, if you could go ahead and show that. This is generated by AI, which is, like I said, a little creepy. I, I don't know where they get the architectural ideas of all of it, but it's fascinating. There's a throne. There is a throne that you can access. I've had encounters. It doesn't exactly look like that, but it's also not all that much different or far off. Different. There's a throne that you can access because of Jesus. There's a door open to the throne. Can you say Amen. There's a door for, for souls. There's a door for witnessing. And we'll, we'll look at this. In, in Acts chapter 27, the apostle Paul says, now I've come, so there's not only a door to the throne, there's a door, there's a door for a witness, for, for sharing our faith and for winning the lost. Acts 14, 27, 
Now when they had gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened a door of faith to Gentiles. There's an open door to reach the lost. That's what they're talking about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says, I'll stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He says, a great door for effective work is open to me. I'm telling you, church, brethren, sistren, anyone under the sound of my voice, all the 86 plus churches in the Philippines, wherever you are listening right now under the sound of my voice, all across the internet, there is a a door that is open for the church right now. And I don't mean just here. I mean, all around the world. Never before have I seen so many people hungry for God, desperate for the Lord, for forgiveness, for truth. People want truth. I was in Israel for 10 days. I'm overwhelmed at how desperate people are. Not just there, but when I was on the airplane and traveling through airports and, and at JFK, one of, our, one of our young adults was playing basketball just last week and shared their faith with some young adults and they, they gave their hearts back to Christ. Maybe you're here in the first service. Maybe you'll be here in the second. There's an open door for a witness, an open door for souls, and you have to realize it. If you don't realize it, you'll never move across a threshold. If you don't know that, you say, well, I've shared with Auntie Bertha and she doesn't want anything to do with church. You might try again because it's, it's gotten crazier out there and people really want to know. And the Spirit of God is moving upon us. He's He's given us an open door for souls. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, verse 2, pardon me, continuing earnestly in prayer, be vigilant with all thanksgiving, verse 3, meanwhile, pray also for us that God would open for us a door, a door for the word. Some doors you need to shut, other doors need to be opened, and I'm so glad that Jesus holds the keys and he shows us how to do that, how to win the lost, how to have an encounter with God, number one a door to the throne, how to, have an, how to win souls, how to witness a door for the lost, a door for souls. And not only that, the third thing I see is a door for kingdom expansion. What do you mean by that? There are opportunities that are going to open. From this day, opportunities are gonna open for you for political office, to be able to serve on a board. There's opportunities for you to, in business. Come on, kingdom marketplace, bringing business. New businesses, kingdom expansion, demonstrations of his power. You might be facing something in your business. You might be facing something with your company. You might be facing something and it looks like a door is closed. Well, I'm gonna just tell you, if God called you to do it, then you can pray that that door gets ripped off its hinges. Some of you don't understand. You need to stop, stop the, the, this dichotomy of a secular mindset and, and a, a, a sacred mindset. That we don't just have church. We are the church and everywhere we go, that, that takes place. So in your real estate business, come on. Come on, as a teacher, as a professor, as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a banker, whatever you do, as a student, whatever you do, as a child, as a mother, as a father, whatever you do, God will release supernatural demonstration. And something happens perhaps with your child and they're injured. You can lay hands on them and a supernatural demonstration of his power can come and your child can be healed on the spot and you're not racing off to the emergency room. You can be healed. You can be free. God can provide. I remember when we poured this slab. Some of you were here. We poured the slab. It is the largest continual pour that's ever been done in the valley. The one you're standing on, sitting on right now, right here. And when we poured it, we needed good weather. And we had good weather up until the time when we didn't. How many of you were here? We were standing there. They're finishing. They're they're doing the finish on the pour. And we see a storm coming out of, the, out, of the, out of the east. Comes out of that glacier, just begins to form these dark clouds. And you can see rain over the butte. And it's just moving this way. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, we're looking at it. And the, uh, one of the, the uh, concrete guys says, Wally, says to Wally, says to me, I'm standing there. He says, if that comes over here, we have lost it. And I'm thinking... Shanda ho ho, ramakababa. Amen, that's tongues, my prayer language. I said, oh, now like no. And Wally just says, and he just boldly prays. 
I'd love to, I wish it was me, but it was Wally. Anyway, he reaches his hand out and we all agreed in the name of Jesus, that thing's not coming on our concrete in Jesus' name. We would have lost the whole poor. Listen, there's no insurance or whatever for that. That, 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 that you lose the poor, you're, you're going to problem. Well, maybe there's insurance for it. I don't know. But I didn't want to experience what we, I didn't want to go down that door. Didn't want to open that door. Didn't want to go across that threshold. Literally, we watched that storm come. And when it, when it came time, we're just about to get rain. It split and went completely around our property. Rained all over on this right side, rained over on this left. And we stood there, not one drop that I could see hit that concrete. And we were just like, yep, that's right. He opens a door for manifestation and power. There's kingdom opportunities. Just because it seems like the door's closed doesn't mean you can't pray. It gets ripped off its hinges. Come on, somebody say, I got keys. Come on, put your hand up like you got some keys. You got some keys. It's not impossible, and with man it is, but with God it isn't. God has opened a door for us in kingdom opportunity in Anchorage. There's opportunities in the lower 48. There's opportunities online. More people are becoming millionaires through online marketplace ideas. Did you know that? All five of you understand that. That's true. You know, God can give you an idea. When we pray this prayer, as Pastor Karen and I fumbled through that, heavens are open. The devourers rebuked. The time of favor is come. Witty inventions and ideas. Houses we didn't build. Vineyards we didn't plant. He gives us power to get wealth. Remember the Lord. He's the one that, remember. That means take action, as, as Pastor Karen taught. There are door kingdom opportunities for you. You're not nearly as excited as I am. I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Investments. This word where it says, I'm loosing a governmental anointing on kings. I have it here in my notes. As the ecclesia, to rule and reign. The ecclesia is a governmental word for the church. Jesus used ecclesia. As a, it's a Greek word for the church. Ecclesia is a, a, a called out group that would vote, a legislative group that would be called out by a crier, by a caller, and they would vote. When they voted, that's what would take place in Roman culture. So when Jesus calls the church the ecclesia, we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if we were just supposed to get saved, you'd drop dead. So we're here to rule. I said, we're here to rule. We're here to expand the kingdom. It's not a sissified, wring your hands, wave a, wave a white flag, hope he comes and rescues you. It's a church that rules. Come on, don't, don't just be, oh, you come and help me. Come and help you. Rise up, take your key, stick it in the door, kick the door open. Man, it's good to be back in church. Come on, somebody say there's an open door for me. Wow. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. Psalm 24 is highlighted by many. Verse 7, lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. And many of you feel hemmed in, like what am I going to do? Maybe it's time to fast and pray. What do you mean what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You take over. You, you exercise your biblical authority and you move forward. And things that were stolen from you, my beloved neighbor, things that were taken were going to be restored even a hundredfold. Things that the enemy crept, crept up. I, when I looked over, I saw a restoration. You can't stop what God is doing when you give, when you serve, when you pray like you do. That which was taken is going to be restored. In some way or another, maybe not the identical thing, but he's, he saw it, it was the enemy, he sucker punched you, and he's going to restore it. Come on, somebody say amen. Now you have to take that and you got to exercise it. All right, how to go through these divine doors, how to use the keys, how to move past or step past or through the threshold. The first thing is with divine assistance is what is needed, of course, the blood of the lamb, the word. You've got to unlock these doors that the enemy seeks to keep closed. There's obstacles. There's doors that are closed. But just because it's closed doesn't mean it's not the will of God. 
well, it's just all good. It's all God, whatever God wants to do. A lot of people have a, um, a sovereign view of God when God wants to partner with you. So what a sovereign view, sovereign, he does what he wants, what he wants to, whoever he wants to, he's sovereign. He's God, he's sovereign, he's the king. But many people take that and lean on it as an excuse for inaction and faith. Let me say that again. Many people take that as, well, God says he wants to do it, then he's just gonna come and do it. When in fact, that's not a biblical viewpoint. According to your Faith may be done unto you. We don't like that because it requires something of us. And I've seen people abused. Well, that didn't happen because you didn't have faith. While that might be true, it's not for you to judge that. And we don't really understand all things. I've, I've had great faith. At least I thought I did and didn't see the miracle come to about. But in the end, I'm just going to trust God. However, I've also seen where I was weak or I was feeling like I, 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 I couldn't do it and I wasn't enough. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you are enough. I'm with you. You and me are a majority. Now stand up, put yourself up by your bootstraps, point at that thing and command it to go. And I mustered strength by the grace of God, mustered faith, pointed my finger and it left. And boom, the door opened. Some of you in your perceived weakness, write in your notes, you have a perceived weakness about yourself and you don't move on from there. Verse eight is, there, is relation to the text here. I know your works. I've see, I've set before you an open door. Come on, someone say that. God has set before me an open door. Say it again. God has set me before, before me an open door. And no one can shut it. Everybody say that. No one. No one can shut it. For you have little strength. I mean, that just seems like a contradiction. You have little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. The term little strength doesn't imply, it doesn't imply weakness, it implies real strength. You see, when you think you're big and you're strong, you're headed for a failure, you're headed for a fall. But when you understand how weak you are, really in the natural, and if it wasn't God to breathe upon you and help you, then you wouldn't be able to overcome. That, that weakness is an opportunity for display of God's strength. How many of you feel weak at times? Good. That's good. How many of you feel inadequate at times? Yeah, that's good. Because if you just think, oh, I'm all that. Ah, yeah, you're, you're, that's what you get. But if you understand that you can't do it without God's help, you can't move forward if he doesn't open the door. You, he, come on, he's going to give you strength. It, it, it means no matter what comes against you, you're going to make it. He's going to bring you through the open door. Now, in context, this is talking to the church of Philadelphia, and they were persecuted, but they didn't give up on the Lord. They didn't reject him. When you're weak, his strength is made perfect, the Lord said to the apostle Paul. Another challenge we have, these doors that the enemy seeks to keep closed is not only our perceived weakness, so some of you perceive yourself to be weak and you stay right there. You perceive yourself to be weak. Now rise up and walk in the power of God. That, that, that's where strength is really perfected. The second thing is distorted perceptions. Now I could take, we could do a whole series on it. In fact, we have strongholds. You're, the way that you perceive God, the way that you perceive his word, the way, that, the way that you think about God are the most important thoughts that you have. And if you have a distortion in your thinking about who he is and who you are in him, then you will never move forward into becoming the victor, the champion that God's intended you to be. You have to deal with your distorted perceptions about God. You need to deal with your distorted perceptions about yourself. You are not a slug that should go in the back and eat worms the rest of your life. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus, God has a plan for you. God has, come on, he, he's hemmed you in before and behind. The glory of the Lord is your rear guard. Come on, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, you, you have to change the way that you think. You need to rewire your brain. You need to regroove your neural paths based upon truth. Well, I just, you just what? Stop. 
I just don't feel, yeah, feelings. We walk by faith, not by sight, not by, we walk by faith, not by hearing, we walk by faith, not by touch. We walk by faith, not by senses. You walk by faith. What does the word say about you? Agree with it. Stop agreeing with the enemy. Change your distorted perception and, and become a spiritual champion. God has made you. He's intended you to walk in victory. Man, I just preached myself happy right now. Thank you, Lord, that victory, victory, oh, sweet victory is mine. Victory in Jesus, victory in Jesus. Ah, na, 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 na. Something like that. I mean, Pastor Alex, I'm sure, knows it. Distorted perceptions can be something that closes the door before you. These are obstacles, these are challenges that the enemy wants to keep in your place so you don't move forward. Another one is persecutions, verse 9. I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I'll make them come and fall before your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Persecution is real for the church in Philadelphia who this was written, but of course it's multifaceted as is all the word of God. It's not just for the church of Philadelphia. It's for us. And you can go through persecutions. I'm pretty sure no one here has been burned at the stake. We currently have freedom of speech, but make no doubt about it that that, that is under attack. And if you live in Canada right now, they've just come out with all kinds of new hate speech laws shutting up the church. They want to shut the church up. Let me just tell you, we will not be shut up no matter what. We won't stop. But, but the, the church in Canada has got to fight for that. Otherwise, people stay in bondage. We don't believe in same-sex marriage. It's not marriage. It's a union that people have decided to do, but we're not going to endorse it as something that God blesses. It's not. Perversion, alcoholism, drug addiction, homosexuality, sin. Sin is sin. I said sin is sin, so we're going to keep calling it that way. Well, you're going to lose some people. Well, you know what? We're going to gain some people, and they're going to get free. I'm not worried about, I'm not here to, to preach to gather a crowd and tickle your ears. I'm here to preach the truth for which I will stand before God on the day of judgment, and so will you. You've got to hear the truth. Don't tiptoe around it. I was in Israel on a bus. And um, which is common in Israel tour on these buses. I was with 20 other pastors just uh, two weeks ago. And while we were there, they asked me to pray. And so I prayed and I, and, and I, and I prayed. I mean, I really fervently prayed with all my heart. And I got to the end and it was a mixed company. There was, there was Christians, but there was Jews and there was an Arab bus driver. I got, I got to the end and I'm like, God, do I just say in Jesus' name? And I, I just wanted to be culturally sensitive. So I said, in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Hope, that, hope that's okay. And the guide who's a Jew says, it's more than okay. Live your convictions. Don't worry about anybody else. And I thought, a Jewish guy is telling me that. I was so rebuked. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't, you know, go like this in, in the name of, of God. I said in Jesus' name. I've been in places where people tiptoe around. I'm so sick and tired of political correctness. And I think so is everybody else. Now, you don't have to be rude. You can be kind. You can be gracious. But for the love of God, speak the truth because you'll stand before the Lord for it. And there can be persecution. Some of you have been persecuted in your family. Why are you going to that big church? Your accountant, why do you tithe? If you're out of your mind, you're giving way too much. That's the day I would fire your accountant. We've had people say, well, you're just giving too much. Seriously. You can get persecuted for living the way that we live for God. And certainly the Church of Philadelphia was persecuted, but they didn't give up on his name. They didn't give up on living for him. Difficult circumstances, verse 10, because you've kept my command to persevere. That's past tense. I'll also, listen, listen closely, I'll also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, the test of those who dwell on the earth. Now, I don't know what that means. It could certainly mean the tribulation, and many would take this to mean a pre-tribulation rapture, a trial that comes upon the whole earth that he's going to keep the church from that and will be brought out before the seven years of tribulation. I don't know for certain, but I know in the midst of difficult circumstances that might be impossible in your mind, you can overcome. You know, the other day I uh, went into an ice bath. Has anybody done that? 
Anybody know the, the plunge thing? No, I don't mean like jump in cold water and get out. We did that for years uh, when I was a kid on March 1st in the Atlantic. We would always go swimming in and out. No, this is 35 degrees and you get into it up to your neck and you wait for three minutes. Has anybody done that? It's kind of like the tribulation. I got in that tank and then the first time we did it, I was with a, with a bunch of the guests and the pastors that were here just recently at our power conference. Man, I wanted to get out. And we had a two minute mark. I waited to a minute and 30 seconds and I'm thinking, what's the big deal? I, I'm, I'm gonna get out. I got out, the other guy stayed past two minutes and I'm like, whatever. So we went into a steam room and a sauna and all that and decided, okay, let's do it again. Now that this do it again thing, I'm following through now. I am not gonna get out of that. And I mean, it hurts. I mean, you're freezing to death. It's a process of death. Who goes in 30 degree water for, th what have you lost your mind? It's a process of hypothermia. So I said, I am not getting out, but I need to see a clock. And so, Pastor Andrew Randall, Pastor Andrew um, Pearson, or pastor in, in Oahu, put his phone up. I said, I need to see that thing. And so we set it for three minutes and 15 seconds. So it counted down from 15. It's like, okay, I, by the time three minutes clicks, you better be in up over your collarbone. So I'm watching that clock. I got in. I got in, and it's cold. So I'm up to my collarbone. I'm watching that thing, and it is going by ever so slowly. And I begin, it's the flesh. I begin to find, this is how I was, not moving. I begin to find comfort that warmth is being produced by my two wrists that are together. And, I, and, and I'm experiencing a little bit of warmth under my arms. Other than that, no warmth. And I'm sitting there going, a minute goes by, and I'm like, okay, we need to shift to suffer mode. Does anybody know what that means? That means like, you're, I, I mean, I just purpose before God, I'm going to finish that stink in three minutes. I'm not getting out with these younger guys who think they're all cool. I'm staying. And I waited and waited. Pastor Josh, so funny. Pastor Josh is like, it turns, it changes in two minutes. Two minutes, he's like, yep, there it is, it's changed. I'm like, what? Nothing changed. Changed for Pastor Josh, didn't change for me. I shifted to suffer mode. It changed at about two minutes and 30 seconds it lessened in pain, and I was able to get up and go through. Listen, you can endure whatever you're going through, but you gotta take authority. Some of you, some of you, some of you quit before you get the breakthrough. I was not gonna quit, I had to watch the clock. It went past three minutes, and then I thought, that's over three minutes, I'm getting out now, and as we, as we got out. I think after a few minutes, it doesn't hurt as much because all your nerves are frozen and dead. But difficult circumstances, they come. And if you'll just endure. Now that, one of the things I liked about that, I actually want to do it again. Yeah, I, I want to get one. Yeah, we're going to get one. Pastor Karen and I are going to do the ice bath thing. I, I, I talked to somebody in the church. They got one of these real fancy ones that's in their finished garage and they do it every morning. And I asked him, why do you like it? He said, it's the hardest thing I'll do all day. I said, hmm, self-inflicted, hardest thing you'll do all day. And then I did it, and I decide, I like it. It's just like an illustration that you can do all things through Christ. Come on, somebody say amen. We, number five, we have a propensity to give up. Some of you have given up before you get the breakthrough. Don't give up. In the words of Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. Never give up. It's not over until you're dead. So don't quit contending for God's promise, contending for the open door, contending for what God says you can have or what God says you can do, being who God says you can be, contend for it. Don't quit. Everybody say, I'm not a quitter. It's a four letter curse word in my family. Don't quit. Where are you gonna go? That's it, I'm not going, I quit. To what? You're gonna, you're gonna go and just retire? You never retire from serving God. Praise God, you had a business, whatever you know, you retire, but you never retire from serving God. All right. We have a propensity to give up, don't do it. Secondly, God's given us his word, his promises, and we must believe them. I'm gonna quickly move through this. He gives us opportunities, you take them. When they come, move forward. 
And if you're in prayer, you'll see them. And then you take them. He gives us his favor. He gives us his favor. Favor is yours. Say that. Favor is mine in Christ. He'll keep us, number three, moving right along. He'll, he will keep us. He will honor us by making us a pillar in his house. Now that's, that's profound. He'll honor us by making a pillar in his house. What does that mean? That means somebody that is immovable. Thank you, Daniel. That means somebody that is set. They, they're, they're, they're set in their convictions. They're set in their walk. They have firm resolve. They're a man or a woman of conviction. They are not moved by every wind and wave of doctrine or circumstances or challenge or COVID or the next pandemic they have planned or whatever. They're not moved. They're a pillar. We have pillars here. I'm looking at some of them. Some of you are a reed. I was a reed when I first came here. The wind would blow this way. I'd get offended. A reed, onion skinned. Oh, they didn't, they, they didn't acknowledge me. Oh, Pastor Chris doesn't want to use me on the worship team. I wanted to be on the worship team so bad. I asked him, he said, no, there's no room. I'm like, okay, well, if there ever is, can you let me know? He's like, sure. Every six months, I'd ask him. He said, you can be in the choir. I'm like, okay, so I was in the choir, and I just kept waiting. Can I, any room now? No. no. And then I remember he called me one, one Friday late and said, hey, Daniel, can you come to the worship practice on Saturday morning? I'd like you to sing on the worship team. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, but I, but, 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 but I have work. He's like, oh, well, that's okay. Never mind. I said, no, wait. Let me just get, let me just get off work, and then, I, then, and then I, I think I can make it. I'll call you back, but I got I to gotta get, I'm, I'm going to call work. I'm going to get off. I called work. They said, you need to be here. I said, I can't. Why not? I said, because I have this church thing I got to be at, and I've prayed that I could be in it for years. I said, I can't. They said, well, that's not doesn't work for us. I said, the reason I'm one of your best employees is because I love God. I need to go Saturday. They said, Okay, I was bold like that. Sounded arrogant, probably was back then, I'm sure. You know that I'm the best. I called Pastor Chris right back and I said, I got off work. He says, yeah, it's okay, it doesn't matter. We already filled the spot. I'll never forget it. I never got another invitation. He didn't mean to, but that, that solidified me to help me not be offended by anybody. He was one of my heroes and he rejected me. And, I, and he didn't mean to reject me, not like that. He didn't know how much it hurt me. I mean, I went and I cried. I thought I just should have said yes and believed God. That my... But God, God, has, God has made me into a pillar and I, and, and I believe he's gonna make me stronger and stronger. I'm not saying I arrived, but forgetting that which lies behind, I press on to the high calling of God. He wants to make you a pillar in the house of God. And look at verse 12. To the one, and this is, I'm bringing this to a close. To the one who is victorious, ushers, we're going to go ahead and take communion, please. Get ready for that. To the one who is victorious, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I'll write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven of my God, from my God. And also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. It's a picture that he will transform you. God wants to transform you. Let me say it again. God wants to transform you. He changes your name. He, he, I've been transformed. Anybody else been transformed? And I'm not done yet. I want to be a better husband, Pastor Karen. I'm going to be a better servant, a better man of God. I'm a, I, I, I am. I am not what I, if you knew me, you wouldn't want to know me all those years ago, 20, 30 years ago. You didn't want to know me. I was, I was dangerous. Dangerous Dan, they used to call me. That was my nickname. Seriously? Yeah. God has changed me and I'm looking for him to transform me again and again and again. You don't have to stay broken. You don't have to stay in a place closed behind some door in some prison. You can be free. You can be healed. And you can fulfill the plan of God. There's an open door. Move beyond the threshold. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast and it's enriched you and helped you in your life. 
If you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do it now? Pray this prayer with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. Thank you that he rose again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each and every person that prayed that prayer out of sincerity of heart. I pray a breaking off of every assignment of darkness, any chain, any bondage, any habit that's not of God, that you would sever it and set them free. I pray and ask Holy Spirit, touch them and fill them now and use them for your purpose and give them a hunger for your word and for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, text us, would you, so that we can help you grow in the things of God text SAVED to the number 907-357-2065. If you don't have a home church, we hope that you would find a home with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you're in some other part of the nation or the world, find a good local church that preaches and teaches God's Word and grow in the things of God. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in future broadcasts or in services. Praise the Lord.